our next presenter. We will be talking about the importance of community education, and our presenter will be Dr. Karen M. Wakefield. Dr. Wakefield is a radiation oncologist at the Mass General Hospital in Boston, Mass. She completed her MD and PhD at Duke University and has the distinction of being the second black woman to graduate from the medical scientist training program at Duke. Her current research is designed to understand and address socio-cultural barriers that contribute to disparities in cancer outcomes, particularly in the black community. From 2010 to 2012, Dr. Winkfield served as the president of the New England Medical Association, whose mission is to represent the interests of physicians of color practicing in New England area and physicians caring for minority patients. She is also a co-founder and current director of the Association of Black Radiation Oncologists, Dr. Winkfield. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And I too want to congratulate um, Tom and Juarez and also Fenn for 10 years. 10 years of community education, 10 years of advocacy, um, and more than 10 years of survivorship um, and warriorship, shall we say. Um, so congratulations. Um, let me just pull up my slides here. I also want to thank the Congressional Black Caucus um, for allowing a session on health and wellness. It's critically important. We have to continue these discussions. And in many ways, I almost feel like I can go home now because <laughs> we've already heard such fantastic um, information from both uh, Tom Farrington and also uh, Congressman Meeks. Um, but let me say that um, anyone who's heard me speak knows that I like to be a little provocative. <laughs> So that will be my intention this morning as well. So thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you so much for anyone who's out there on the webcast who might be listening in. Really appreciate your time and attention this morning. It's critically important to talk about community education. And since we're talking about education, let's start with a few definitions. So I'm a radiation oncologist, which means I'm a specialist who uses x-rays to treat cancer. I'm not a radiologist, I don't look at images. I'm not an oncologist, a specialist who actually uses chemotherapy or other systemic agents, I use x-rays. It's a very complex and important part of cancer care along with the folks who diagnose are radiologists. The other folks who help, the pathologists who look at samples, surgeons, so surgical oncologists, important part of the cancer continuum as well as oncologist, as I've mentioned. So I'm a radiologist, a radiation oncologist, and I'm, I specialize in the care of patients who have hematologic malignancies primarily, but I also treat women with breast cancer. But my focus, as you heard, in terms of education, community education, spans across the board of diseases, disease spectrum, because it's critically important for us to really understand the epidemic that's facing the black community. So let, what is community education? Some people call it community-based education or community learning and development. It really refers to uh, programs designed to promote learning and social development within specific communities. It's interesting because this is a, developed from a, a, um, a definition I found online using a range of formal and informal methods. And so that's a critical piece because one of the things that Tom Farrington asked me to discuss was really how do we know when a program is successful? If you have a program, it's really important to show success. If you had looked at FEN maybe five years ago, would the success be the same as it is today? And how do you measure that? How do you measure the impact of community education in our communities? It's critically important, particularly when we're asking people to fund our initiatives, which is critically important. We've got to make sure we're doing enough to fund these. So let me move on to talk a little bit about formal education programs. Um, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm very, very active in the community, particularly in Boston, but also in the New England area. 
there's a program is, and it's important to work together, right? So much of the formal education that I've been involved in has been participating in some of the events that have heard, been held at churches. And we'll hear a little bit about that later today. Um, also with FEN, so partnering with community-based organizations whose mission it is to actually make sure we're promoting health awareness and education in our communities. Also making sure we're out in the community and doing um, health fairs. This was an event that I participated in a couple of weeks ago in Mattapan, which is a section of, of Boston that has a very large African-American um, um, cohort of, of folks who live there. And it's really important to do that but also to use other sorts of media. So you can see this is a, a link to my web page, um, which is critically important, using social media, um, using the things that we have at our disposal, Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, believe it or not, they work in terms of educating. Also making sure we're using other forms of media. Some of you may have heard my radio talk in, in Boston. Again, collaboration between other um, church organizations. This happened to be with the Nation of Islam. They thought it was a very important thing to make sure we're utilizing all forms of media to make sure we're addressing this issue of community education. And so you can actually go to my website and actually hear some of the webcasts that we've had, particularly around this issue of socioeconomic status and how it impacts health. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because I think what's important to remember is that health is not just the absence of disease. There are other factors that go into health. So let's talk a little bit about that. I mentioned again, we're gonna be talking about community um, education, but I also wanna highlight the importance of community engagement. We've gotta start moving people. It's not enough to have people sitting in the audience and listening. People have got to take action, and that means engagement. How do we do that? Well, again, we will hear from some of the church partners that FEN is going to be working with. You've already heard the fantastic news that they've moved from doubling the number of participants they've had and really looking forward to doing the same again in 2015. We're going to hear about the role of women. And yesterday we had some powerful testimony. I remember Dr. Robeson who spoke yesterday about the importance. It was his girlfriend sitting in the room who said, well, why aren't we biopsying this, right? So women have an incredibly important role, not only in terms of educating our communities, but being there to support our men as they make decisions and have discussions with their physicians about screening. So talking about screening, talking about making sure we're getting the appropriate treatment. What is the appropriate treatment? And making sure that we're supporting our men as they battle some of the, the um, emotional components of illness critically important. And then we're also going to hear from other partners. I know that uh, FEN is also partnering with other folks. They've had their partners in, in industry, which is critically important. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. So my goal today is to talk about what we need to be educating our communities about. In this country, the United States actually has the highest per capita expenditure on health care. We spend more dollars, more, a higher percentage of our gross domestic product on health care than any other nation in a developed world. So we should have the best outcomes, right? Everyone in the country should be healthy if we're spending that much money, correct? Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. And what's even more of a paradox is that in this nation where we're spending money on technology, technological advances, we're doing so much. Even in cancer, we are curing cancers that 20 years ago were killing people. But we're curing them. We cure breast cancer. We cure forms of lymphoma. We can cure cancer. It's critically important. But you have seen this slide over and over again. You saw it yesterday. This is cancer death rates. And look who is impacted the most, African American men. If this is death rates overall, all types of cancers, and much of this is driven by prostate cancer incidence and mortality. These curves, and even though we see this nice downslope towards the end here, this actually only goes up to 2007, we see that we're making progress in terms of cancer mortality. But what disturbs me most is that huge gap that exists, both between black men and white men. And if you look further down, the blue line versus the white line, African American women, and, Afri and white women. There is a gap and there's a disparity. And it should be a clarion call to our communities. Why aren't we fighting this? Why isn't it a bigger issue in our communities, this disparity that exists? So my thought is perhaps we don't know. 
Maybe we need to do a better job educating our communities. Maybe we need to do a better job reaching out and talking to people whenever we can about the importance of making sure that we maintain healthy communities. It's our responsibility to maintain healthy communities, with the help of others, of course. But what's scary is that this curve, the way that this curve looks, and take a look at it. I want you to take a good look at what this curve looks like. African-American men with the worst outcomes, worst mortality than any other group. But the same for, white, for, for, for black women. We're worse in terms of our outcomes than white women. If we look at every disease across the spectrum, it's exactly the same. Cardiovascular mortality, hypertension, diabetes, HIV AIDS, infant mortality, which is scary that in this nation that spends so much money per capita, that we are doing, in, we're doing worse than some developing nations in terms of infant mortality. And it doesn't matter. Socioeconomic status or education doesn't matter. It even impacts women, black women who are educated, who have college degrees, infant mortality. It's a travesty. And HIV AIDS is something that we've got to talk about in our communities as well. Because one of the sad things is, is that the incidence of HIV AIDS is growing fastest among black women. Black women. And remember those curves where it went black men highest mortality, white men highest mortality, and then black women? Do you know that now black women are actually dying of HIV AIDS at a higher rate than white men? We've got to do better in our community, but perhaps we don't know. Perhaps we need to educate our communities about this epidemic of healthcare disparities. So what are some of the reasons for these disparate outcomes? Well, we heard a little bit about it yesterday. There certainly is a component of biologic determin determinants, but there's also a huge component of social determinants of health. So the biologic component is just genetics. And we heard about some potentially interesting things about the genetic basis of prostate cancer, we're still working on that. What was even more interesting to me was this concept of genomics, right? So how the genes that a person has interact with one another, which I think is actually more important, particularly in light of the stresses that blacks face every day in their life. We'll talk about that, as I mentioned, provocative, okay? So it's important to look at those things, look at the environment. How does the environment, what is it like for folks who are, are poor, who live in housing complexes, who are, have all these environmental exposures, where you have rat feces, or you have other allergens that are constantly bombarding your healthcare system, your immune system. And we know that stress and inflammation, as we heard yesterday, actually drives some of the development and the progression of prostate cancer. What does that do to us? And what are we doing in our communities to make sure that we're educating ourselves, that we've got to do better to get out of those situations? The other thing, the social determinants, socioeconomic status. Again, I urge you to go to my website and take a listen to that one little segment there on socioeconomic status, because it includes income, education, and occupation. There are three parts and three components. And if you look at the educational status of our communities, the black community, we've got to do better. There are people who died so that we can educate ourselves. They died. We know that schools were integrated not that long ago. 50 years we've had integration, right? And even in some states, long, later, earlier than that, few, fewer years than that, my husband actually went to a segregated elementary school. It's unbelievable. But the bottom line is that we are throwing away educational opportunities in our community. We've got to do better because it impacts our health. It's very important. Access to care, and one of the things that is very important, and I hope that each of you, um, we've got to do a better job as a black community enrolling in clinical trials. We have all of these treatments, we have all of these screening tools, but we do not know if the screening is the same in the black population and the white population. Do we know really what the PSA level should be in black men? We know that their testosterone levels are higher than, than white men. So, but we've got to do a better job, but that's up to us. We've got to demand that we be allowed into these clinical trials. And I understand access is a problem. We talked about, we had one gentleman who stood up and talked about comorbidities as being a roadblock. But it also requires us as physicians, clinicians, to be involved, but you to advocate. You've got to go to your providers and say, this is an outrage. 
why can't I participate in these trials? We've got to be at the table. We've got to be there in the design and implementation of these trials so that we can understand and make sure that our communities are well represented. So I'm not going to talk about this. I just want you to look at this. This is a slide I grabbed from Barbara Ferrer, who's the executive director of the Boston Public Health Commission, about the impact of racism on health and social determinants. It's real. I saw on the news this morning where a young man was at a routine traffic stop at a gas station. I don't know how many people saw that. Mm-hmm. Routine traffic stop. Cop tells him to go ahead and get his license, and what happens? He gets shot. Shot. But this is, the, this is the tough thing about being a black man in particular, black man in the United States. It's a stressful thing every single day. And you apologize to the cops. <laughs> it's a travesty that we allow this to happen in our communities. And people are like, oh, well, now it's, it's hunting day on, on hunting season on black men. It always has been. We just now see it more because everybody's got their phones, right? You got your iPhone. So we are seeing it now, so we've got to do better about advocating on our own behalf. Health, and this is the World Health Organization definition of health, and I love this. It's a state of complete physical, mental, and social, social well-being. We cannot be well if we can't walk outside of our door without a fear of being shot. We can't be well if we have a stigma associated with wearing our hair the way it naturally grows out of our head. We've got to make sure we're doing better in advocating. So remember that health is a compilation of all these things, not just the absence of disease. So when we talk about health promotion, health education in our communities, these are the things that we need to talk about. It's time to level the playing field. I love this slide. I can't remember where I got this picture from. But remember, we talk, people talk about equality, equal this and that. Uh-uh. It's got to be equity. We have a long way to go. We have to make sure that we are getting more than what other groups are because we're so far behind. We need more support, which rem rem means that we have to advocate. We have to talk to our, our government officials. As, the, as Congressman Meek said, we've got to be there. And not only the CBC, Congressional Black Caucus is doing their job. Certainly, everybody can do more. But we need to make sure we're also communicating with folks who are not members of the CBC. Get there, get involved, and advocate. How do we improve community involvement? Education. Simple as that. We need to train and develop skilled outreach workers. We use it in other countries all the time where we actually are able to educate community health workers. We need to do that in our communities. We need to make sure that we're utilizing the health ministries at whatever places of worship you might go to. We've got to do a better job at galvanizing people and making sure that those health workers have the adequate information so they know where to point people when they have questions. We need to use more and really focus on community-based organizations like FEN. We're doing incredible, incredible work around this nation. Each and every one of you here, I see so many FEN members here that I've seen over and over and over again who are out there and advocating and sharing their stories about their warriorship. It's important and we've got to keep doing that. But it's also individuals, each of you sitting in the audience here who are listening on the webcast, it's up to individuals to make sure that we are educating ourselves and making sure that we're informed so that we can form the appropriate partnerships. Does it work? Well, this is an article that was published in 2003 that talked about community-based health promotion and talked about many community-based programs have had only modest impact. Now, this was early in the phase where community-based work was even thought of as a research entity, quote unquote. And I loathe to think of community education as research, frankly. But it is important, again, if we're going to look to find people to fund these sorts of initiatives, we have to make sure that we have the appropriate metrics to say, is this program successful? Which means we need to define what success is. And we need to make sure we have enough funding so that, because many of the things, in terms of behavior change, it takes a long time. It takes a long time to change behaviors, right? So if you have a community that for eons has been dis disenfranchised, and for many, many years, centuries in fact we have, been disenfranchised for years, and taught that our health isn't important, and taught that it's not okay to talk about prostate cancer, or talk about things that have to do with sexual dysfunction. We've got to change that behavior, but it takes time to do that. And so it's up to us to define what those metrics of success are. What does success mean for us? But also to define it for other people so that they can understand. 
there's some very good information I'm about to wrap up here that kind of looks at the importance. This one top story um, here, but prostate cancer disparities in South Carolina by one of my colleagues at Dana-Farber, um, Bettina Drake, um, really talked about the importance of women and making sure that actually wives are at the table when physicians are having discussions with patients around prostate cancer screening, making decisions about it. It's really critically important. Women, we have a lot of stake in here. And as um, is it Jim West, who said, you think he's here, is Jim here today from Florida? It's a family affair. It's a family affair, right? Prostate cancer, it's a family affair. It impacts everyone, okay? Um, we heard a little bit about the barbershops earlier. And also, I think one of the things that I found interesting about this article by Ray et al. was that survivors can be affected. We see that with Fen, right? These survivors are important in making sure that we are promoting cancer education and positive attitudes towards screening and fostering conversations about prostate cancer, but we need to go one step beyond and make sure that we're giving information about risks of screening and also decision making, edu educating about decision making. It's important. And as a physician, it's critically important for me when my patients come in and are educated. It helps. It makes it much easier for us to have those discussions before the diagnosis, right? You don't want to have to all of a sudden start looking up prostate cancer, right, if you get a diagnosis. You need to know beforehand so that it makes it easier and simpler to have those discussions with your physicians. So this is um, the critical components of community engagement. We need to make sure that we're focusing on policies that are good for health, not just health policies. Have to be good for health in all communities. We have to make sure that we're finding funding to, for, to support these efforts and also to build strategic partners. I need to throw in a plug for this, um, this Mass General Hospital, the Lazarus uh, Mass General Hospital Cancer Care Equity Program, which is really designed to help improve awareness around the importance of minorities to enroll in clinical trials. I have some handouts, actually. You can see them outside, so hopefully you can grab those on your way out. One of them is actually just a sheet that actually explains what the program is. You know, it's sometimes important to have funding, right? We, it's hard to do clinical trials sometimes because of the amount of time that may be required. But the other thing is it's important to be educated. So we have education, educational programs, and that's important. The other thing, there's another sheet on there about clinical trials and understanding what clinical trials are, frequently asked questions. So please pick that up on your way out. So what is the goal of community education? I love this definition. This was actually at a school where it's really to bring members, community members together to identify and leak community needs and resources in a manner that helps people to help themselves. We've got to help ourselves. We've got to advocate for ourselves. So how can you help? This is my AAA approach. I use this all the time. It's important for us to be aware, to become ambassadors, and to advocate. Critically important, the AAA. Be aware of what screening treatments are available. Be aware of your body when things change. Don't hesitate to bring it up. Talk to your spouse about things, other family members. You know, I just noticed X, Y, Z has happened. Have you noticed anything strange or any, anything you can think of? Awareness, self-awareness is critically important. And bring it up to your physicians and make sure we're educating our physicians about some of the important issues around quality of life, right? Critically important. We need to be ambassadors on that. We need to talk to our friends and our family members and talk to our communities. And we definitely need to advocate. We've got to work on public policy that's going to make sure that we have the resources that we need to continue this battle against these prostate cancer disparities. So it's critically important. I thank you very much. I'm going to put up my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me at any point in time. I am happy to be a resource for my community. And I look forward to continuing on in this fight against prostate cancer disparities. Thank you. take a couple of questions for Dr. Wingfield right now. Anyone? Sure. Great presentation, Dr. Wingfield. Um, I'm Reggie Tucker, Seeley Assistant Professor, Harvard School of Public Health, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Um, I loved your definition related to community education, where we go in and we ask communities what they need. But generally, what communities need, uh, those things are outside of the purview of uh, healthcare institutions. So generally, it, especially in this economic climate, it's focused on jobs, financial resources, education. So how can those of us who are public health researchers and healthcare researchers sort of focus on those things that may be outside of traditional health research? 
Thank you so much for that question, Dr. Tucker Seeley. Um, you probably could answer it a lot better than I can, considering <laughs> he's a social epidemiologist. Um, you know, I think it is a challenge, um, particularly when you have funding sources that ask you to identify one specific component, one disease. Okay, I'm going to fund this outreach on prostate health, or I'm going to fund this research on breast health. But they fail to take into consideration the context in which we live, the context in which patient live, patients live. So I'm an advocate, a huge advocate, in taking a holistic approach to any of these community education programs. And it does start with what's going on at home? You know, where are you living? You know, what are your daily stressors? But physicians, unfortunately, oftentimes don't have the time to kind of take the time to have those mm -hmm. conversations. But I think what's imperative is for researchers, those of us who are kind of looking at trying to move this field forward, to start incorporating some of that into our asks. So when we actually write grants, think about that the context of the patients that we're going to be serving when we write those grants. It's a challenge, but that's why it takes, you know, minds to work together, right, and say, well, what are the metrics, and how do we define success of that, right? Because obviously the more factors that you put in, the more complicated the metrics are going to be in terms of defining success. But frankly, if we don't deal with some of those other issues, the socioeconomic status, the, you know, the, the job situation, we will never be able to close that gap. Great question. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. You have... Um, made my job a little harder now. I have to learn to go out and ask. What am I going to be asking for? Money to bring Tom Farrington to my state. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, it's not a laughing matter. Question I'd like you to, um, a comment I'd like you to expand on. As an advocate in a community, in a state, one of the most difficult thing I find is to get men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer to share it with their families. Mm. I've had widows who come to me and say, I know he had the disease, treated, I've driven him to the doctor, they, that late husband and the, the doctor will not allow her in the room. We have got to change this mindset and men will tell me to my face, I don't want her in there. It's my business. But I say to them, she's got a vested interest in you. And that's good enough reason for having her in the discussion. So please uh, yes. talk. So you're absolutely right. That's Jim West, for those of you who don't know. Um, <laughs> like I said, his, 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 making sure that it's a family affair. I'm trying to look to see if I have your brochure so I can look at what the name of the organization is. So you're with um, the Prostate Cancer Foundation down in St. St. Petersburg, right? Yeah, Prostate Cancer Foundation. Yes, fantastic. So, um, yes. So part of that is, again, education. Educating men about the importance of making sure that they're sharing their health history with their family. We heard a discussion, I think it was Dr. Connolly yesterday, who talked about the importance of making sure you know what your family tree looks like. Mm -hmm. we, we, I, I'm almost sure more than 50% of us in here probably couldn't tell you, <laughs> couldn't tell each other if there was cancer history in their family. I certainly can. I don't know what my family's history is because we don't talk about it. And it's something that must change. And I think it's harder, particularly as the black population in the United States gets more culturally diverse, right? We have a lot of immigrant populations who definitely don't want to have that conversation. So that's why it's important to have community health workers, right? So I know from my experience with breast cancer that Haitian women don't always touch themselves, right? They don't touch their breasts. But we know that being self-aware is critically important in terms of detecting things that might change. So you have to start by having people who are culturally competent, culturally sensitive, and who look like the people that you're reaching out to to have these conversations. That's why FEN's so important, right? The fact that we have men sitting here in this audience who are willing to stand up and say, I had prostate cancer, let me tell you my story. It's a start. It's critically important, it's a huge start, but we've got to do our part to making sure that we're educating each other. The other thing, like you mentioned, I think it's important to make sure that we educate providers, right? It's critically important, again, that study that I showed, it makes a difference in terms of outcomes when women are sitting in the rooms with their spouse. 